for 15 years, I was uh, uh, an ordinary, if I can call it that, uh, a criminal lawyer. Um, an honorable uh, profession, uh, being a defense lawyer. Uh, some of the people you represent are guilty. Some of the people you represent are innocent. Uh, most of the people you represent are really somewhere in between. And they want you uh, to help them uh, counter uh, a legal system that uh, uh, does them uh, no favors. And for 15 years, I, I did that. And for 15 years, I was, I was very satisfied uh, with what I did. And then uh, for me, uh, on July the 30th of uh, 1992, a uh, monumental event happened uh, in terms of my future, my future professional, uh, my future profession particularly. Uh, a man who, whose name actually was just mentioned, uh, called Guy Paul Moran, uh, was convicted uh, of a crime he didn't commit. He uh, was only uh, in his mid-twenties at the time. I didn't really know him, but he asked me if I would do his appeal. And when he asked me that, I didn't know that he hadn't committed the crime. I just knew that he'd been convicted of it, and a lot of people said he hadn't uh, committed it. But people who really didn't know uh, the case necessarily that well didn't know the story uh, behind his, his, his trial uh, and his conviction very well. I thought I'd just tell you uh, for a couple of minutes um, how I came to believe, even know, uh, that he didn't commit the crime. On October the 3rd of 1984, a little girl called Christine Jessup, she was nine years old, uh, disappeared uh, from her home. And it was almost three months later uh, that they found her body some 20 to 30 miles from where her parents lived in Queensville. Uh, they found her body uh, in uh, a field uh, decomposed uh, in Oshawa. And for the next four months of 1985, she, or the police rather, uh, came up with no suspects of any significance. And then, come March of 1985, they focused on Guy Paul Moran, someone they hadn't even been aware of before then. But Guy Paul Moran lived next door uh, to Christine Jessup. And to the police, they decided he was strange. He's not, but they decided he was. It was convenient, really, for them to decide he was. They were under tremendous pressure public pressure and personal pressure, no doubt, to solve the case. The terrible rape murder of a little nine-year-old girl. They had a new suspect, and they decided to charge him in April 22nd of 1985. Two months later, on uh, July 1st of 1985, two people came forward who were in the same jail as Guy Paul, two sex offenders and claimed that Guy Paul uh, had confessed uh, the crime to them. The police immediately came in and put, put a wire on one of them and said, go back to him and get him to, do it, get him to confess to you again. And so a day of conversation between this inmate and Guy Paul uh, was recorded uh, on, uh, on a body pack uh, that this uh, jailhouse informant uh, who had gone to the police uh, had on his body. Guy Paul said nothing that could be considered remotely uh, incriminating. Hardly surprising he didn't commit the crime. But he said, did say something that, to me, was proof, if you like, of his innocence. Christine Jessup, when they'd found, when she had disappeared and when they found her body, she'd been wearing uh, pink pants, and they were found uh, beside uh, where her body was found. Her killer had removed them, of course, uh, in order to rape her. Guy Paul was asked by this inmate on the body pack a whole series of questions about the case. And one of the questions he asked Guy Paul was, what was she wearing when they found her? And Guy Paul said, she was wearing a blue skirt. And I read this and I, on the transcript of the conversation, and I said, why 
would he have said that? If there's one thing the killer would have known, it's that she was wearing pink pants. Well, it turned out there was a very ready explanation for why Guy Paul thought she was wearing a blue skirt. Because two days earlier, he'd been at his own preliminary hearing, and the pathologist had testified at his preliminary hearing. And his pathologist had been asked to describe the clothing that Christine Jessup was wearing when her body had been brought to him to conduct the autopsy. And the pathologist, for some unknown reason, had made a mistake. He'd said that she was wearing a blue skirt, when in fact she wasn't. And so Guy Paul naturally thought that she was wearing a blue skirt. If he'd been the killer, he would have known that that was wrong. And that little fact satisfied me that we were dealing with a man who was innocent. And that, in turn, made me spend essentially the next two and a half years doing virtually nothing but his case because I, was so, I felt so committed to freeing an innocent man from prison. On January the 15th of 1995, some two and a half years after his wrongful conviction, we got some DNA results from semen that had been retrieved from uh, Christine Jessup's uh, body. And the semen, there was one thing that could be said about it from the DNA results was that it could not have been left there by Guy Paul Moran. He was the one person in the world we knew then could not have been the one to have left that semen there. And he was acquitted, indeed exonerated, in the Ontario Court of Appeal just down the street at Osgoode Hall, Queen Anne University. But for me, as it turned out, little did I know, the story was to start again just 24 hours later. Because there was then a huge stories in the media about Guy Paul's acquittal and exoneration. And those stories were read by a man called David Milgard, who was then out living in BC. David Milgard had already spent 23 years in prison for a crime that he had been saying for all those years and more he hadn't committed. He'd been convicted of the rape murder of a nurse in downtown Saskatoon on January the 31st of 1969. In March of 1992, after he'd spent 23 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, David Milgard had been set free after a judgment by the Supreme Court of Canada who held that there was now a reasonable doubt as to whether or not David had killed Gail Miller. David read the story. He wanted DNA done in his case too. As he put it over the phone to me, he called me at home. He said, I want that. So I spent the next two years with others trying to get him that. We managed to retrieve the exhibits that were still preserved, the clothing of Gail Miller. And we sent the clothing off to a laboratory in the UK for DNA examination. And on her nurse's uniform, she'd been raped and murdered on the way to work at, at uh, 10 to 7 in the morning in Minus 40 degrees centigrade was the temperature that morning. On her nurse's uniform were found huge quantities of semen. And the semen was typed. And it did two things in this case. Not just, as in Guy Paul Moran's case, show that Guy Paul hadn't committed the crime, or in this case, that David Milgard hadn't committed the crime. By luck, we also had the DNA of the person that we believed had perpetrated the crime. A man who had been convicted of a series of uh, rapes in the city of Saskatoon around the time of Gail Miller's murder. We had his DNA as well. His name was Larry Fisher. And lo and behold, the semen found on Gail Miller's uniform matched Larry Fisher to a degree in the Trillions, one in trillions. Five days later, Larry Fisher was arrested 28 years after Gail's murder and charged with her murder and is now serving a life sentence for it. Wrongful convictions abound to 
cause one to feel passionate for the individual who you believe has been uh, wrongly convicted. We are lucky in this country in, in one regard, that they're not so lucky uh, south of the border. And that is at least a wrongful conviction can't lead to a wrongful execution. But there's no doubt that wrongful convictions do lead to wrongful executions now south of the border, not in this country. We're very lucky in Canada. In 1976, the death penalty in Canada was abolished. And we're very lucky, or have been, very lucky in Canada that for more than 50 years, the prime ministers of our country, one after another, opposed the death penalty. Of all parties, of all stripes, John Diefenbaker, Lester Pearson, Pierre Trudeau, Joe Clark, Brown Mulroney, John Turner, Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin, all, one after the other, and Kim Campbell, opposed the death penalty. And it saddens me to know that today, for the first time in more than 50 years, we have a prime minister of this country who supports the death penalty. To me, to support the death penalty is a moral, or to oppose the death penalty is a moral issue. And I believe that those who support it, including our prime minister, show a remarkable indifference to human life in their support of it. In the United Kingdom, in the last few years, there have been four cases where the United Kingdom courts have acknowledged that people were executed for crimes they did not commit. Timothy Evans, executed in 1950 for the murder of his wife and baby, a crime he did not commit. A man called George Kelly, executed in 1952, for, the, for the, the shooting during the course of a robbery of a post office, a crime he did not commit. Derek Bentley, convicted of the murder of a police officer in 1951 and executed, a crime he did not commit. And Mahmoud Matan, a Somali seaman, convicted in Cardiff in 1952, Wales, and executed, a crime he did not commit. And in fact, in his case, in 1999, some 47 years later, when he was finally cleared in the Court of Appeal in England, the judge presiding at the appeal said in a remarkably effective understatement that capital punishment is not perhaps a prudent culmination of a criminal justice system which is human and therefore fallible. And of course that's right. The criminal justice system is bound to be fallible. The criminal justice system depends on people getting it right, from police to prosecutors to defense lawyers to judges to witnesses to juries. And they don't always get it right. One of the people whose cases I was involved in was the case of Stephen Truscott. Again, that was mentioned in my introduction. Stephen Truscott was 14 years of age when he was convicted in 1959 of the murder of 12-year-old Lynn Harper. Once again, a rape murder. It's not necessarily coincidental that so many of these cases are murders that involve a, 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 sex, a sex crime at the same time because it's those cases where there is such pressure placed on the authorities to solve the case and solve it quickly. And Stephen Truscott, at 14 years of age, convicted of a crime he didn't commit and, God help us all, sentenced to death at the age of 14. He spent more than three months on death row in the Goderich jail. A 14-year-old boy, can you imagine it? Many of you are 14 or only just a little bit older than that and can probably imagine it much better than I, much better than any of us adults can. Terrifying, a terrifying experience, especially when he didn't do it. Three and a half months, and they finally at least uh, uh, set aside 
his death penalty. They commuted it, so he served a life sentence. And it was more than 45 years later that he came to me in an organization in which I'm involved and asked us for help. And it took us 10 years to finally set aside that wrongful conviction and have him acquitted of the crime that he did not commit back in 1959. In fact, a total of 49 years had passed before he was finally acquitted of the crime that he didn't commit. I thought I might give the last word here to one of the wrongly convicted. He's a man who someone just mentioned to me a few minutes ago, a man called Bill Mullins Johnson. Bill Mullins Johnson was an Ojibwe, lived in the Sioux, and he lived with his brother and his brother's wife and his brother's two children, one of whom was called Valen. On October the 10th of 1993, Bill was at home babysitting in the evening, Valen and her brother, put them to bed, went to sleep himself. His brother and his brother's wife came home late at night after a baseball tournament. Everyone went to sleep. The next morning, the mother gets up, goes into Valen's room, and there she is dead on her bed, a five-year-old girl. Within 12 hours, Bill Mullins Johnson was charged with her murder. And he spent the next 13 years in jail for a crime, not just a crime he didn't commit, but as it turned out, a crime that was no crime. Valen died of natural causes. But there was an enormous rush to judgment in his case in that 12-hour period. And within 12 hours, Bill Mullins Johnson was not just accused of murder, he was accused of committing murder in the midst of sodomizing his niece. Can you imagine anything worse? And even worse, he was convicted of it. Eventually, we managed to establish that the pathology in which a well-known Dr. Charles Smith was heavily involved was in fact, one can best describe it as junk science. She'd neither been sodomized nor strangled. She had died of natural causes. Dr. Smith has become quite infamous. He was a pathologist who set about, seemingly, convicting as many people as he could of crimes that never happened, people of crimes that they didn't commit. And a public inquiry was held and in the midst of the public inquiry, Dr. Smith was testifying, and he was purporting to apologize to all those people whose convictions he had caused wrongfully. And one of the people in the courtroom, sitting a mere six yards from him, was Bill Mullins Johnson, a big six-foot-seven man, a powerful-looking man, an impressive figure. And I asked him if he would consider apologizing to Bill himself. And Bill then stood up, and Dr. Smith gave him a sort of an apology. And, Bill's, and he asked Bill to accept it. Smith said, sir, I don't expect you to forgive me but I do want to make it very clear to you I'm profoundly sorry for the role that I placed in the ultimate decision that affected you. I am sorry. To which Bill Mullins Johnson said in front of, there must have been about 150 people in the room, for my healing, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget what you did to me. You put me in an environment where I could have been killed any day for something that never happened. You destroyed my family my brother's relationship with me, and my niece that's still left, and my nephew that's still living. They hate me because of what you did to me. I'll never forget that, but for my own healing, I must forgive you. When you have 
something like that happening to someone that you know or come to know, and you listen to those powerful, evocative words that Bill spoke that day, you can surely understand why anyone involved in trying to help the wrongly convicted is engaged in a work of passion. Thank you.